How you guys doing? Excellent. So um, since we have such a small group, uh, maybe just kind of go around the room and introduce yourself and say uh, what institution you're from. We'll start over here. So you're the APD. Oh, <laughs> I am the APD. <laughs> nice, I love it. Congratulations. Wow, great new program, match new residents, and you're the clerkship director. Wonderful. And you're doing a research fellowship? Excellent, excellent, welcome. Core faculty after your EMS fellowship. Wonderful. Oh, wow. Love it. Oh, wow. Excellent. So you're director of SIM. Wonderful. Congrats. Wash U, junior faculty, excellent, good job. And just would they introduce our speakers as well? You guys can, we're all in the same room. We're actually going to have you give a talk, actually. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but whatever you want on your computer, pull it up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dave Cooperman. I am the chair of the Professional Institute of Student Diversity and Leadership. And uh, I uh, run a team of our research members, one uh, national and one global around the use of this medicine. And I'll just kind of share some of that stuff with you along with uh, career development. Yeah, and I'm Josh Gatman. I'm moderating this session. Uh, I did a uh, Wow, excellent. There's some ultrasound people in here. I know that we're distracted by Sono. <laughs> Games is next, but we can hear it, and yeah, we're oh, like thanks. picturing our friend. Yeah, so that's okay. Well, so um, the objectives uh, for my talk are to differentiate the tracks of an academic career, research, educational, clinical. Uh, and I'm gonna get really granular with some of that, just so, and it's gonna be 10 slides of a lot of text, and I apologize ahead of time, that's the heavy lifting. Then I'm gonna get more sort of inspirational after that. And we'll talk about what makes a career in academic medicine unique, uh, some of the distinctive challenges that face junior faculty, and then uh, how to select a career track and, and some tips for success. Uh, this is a typical org chart that you'd see in any department. This is my department. There's, uh, we have three vice chairs, just so you can kind of see how things sort of feather out in this world of academia. We have vice chairs of uh, academic affairs and research. We have a vice chair of clinical operations and a vice chair of education. Under my vice chair of education, you could see um, she oversees the uh, undergraduate medical education, the graduate medical education, and the continuing med medical education. So all those things, including the fellowships, they all kind of report to her. And the, the uh, vice chair of operations, the engine that runs our department, uh, all of the uh, divisions kind of report to her that have any clinical uh, uh, relations at all. So like the division of ultrasound is very clinical. It's lots of billing and stuff associated with it. So that all goes through her. For example, our Catalina contract goes through her. And then our vice chair of academic affairs, kind of two jobs, academic affairs, helping our folks get promoted and giving them advice on their dossier and getting them through the academic ranks. Uh, and then also he is the uh, vice chair of research and uh, all the research folks report to him, like our statisticians, et cetera, in the MRAP program. 
Um, but in the end, we're just one big happy family, I think. And I don't look at somebody and go, oh, you're my vice chair of operations. And I just look at somebody like, you're my colleague. This is, uh, we're a big family. And uh, at the end of the day, we, it's all about that sort of harmony. And that's my whole goal as the chair is to recruit and make sure everybody's getting along and as happy as they could possibly be. And as Barbara Streisand said one time, um, I'm only as, a parent is only as happy as their least happiest child. Uh, I can tell you, uh, I only have one child, so, it's like, so there's that. But, uh, but I had 22 faculty. And so, you know, I got like a, one or two that, you know, are always a little grumpy. So uh, that's where my level of happiness kind of lies in my group. But overall, I think, you know, if you take it the whole picture, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. So this is the heavy lifting I told you about. And I apologize for these next 10 slides. But there's a lot of uh, text, and there's really no other way to get this to you. I recently had my faculty send me job descriptions, like write your job description and the number of hours you spend doing all that stuff. So my, uh, like the research, uh, my vice chair of research, I said, what, do you, what, are the, what are the times you spend doing this? You can see here he's in all these meetings, he's doing a lot of collaboration, consortium, sponsored trials expansion, um, working with the MRAP, our research associates, um, working with the residents and on their evidence-based lectures. And so he's, you know, this is what he spends his time doing as a research director. And then I looked at the tracks of an academic career. So that was research. Now we're talking about the, the education tracks. We've got several education tracks. We've got, um, you know, like the residency director um, and uh, the, 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 with the graduate medical education, they're doing, spending a lot of time on committees with the curriculum. They're creating TBLs and games and working with that learning management system, Schoology. Um, they're interviewing applicants. You know what program directors do. It's, 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 a, it's a huge job. Um, medical student education, we have a clerkship uh, director in here. Um, you're spending a lot of time advising medical students. I had this role for a while and I spent a lot of time getting them sort of to calm down and find the right places to apply and depending how, uh, you know, uh, competitive they are, writing slows, uh, ERAS, match day, structuring the clerkship, all the curriculum and, and the didactics that go into making the clerkship uh, awesome. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't as common to have mandatory clerkships in emergency medicine for medical schools. And now it's like widespread, including where I work, where all 104 medical students have to go through emergency medicine to graduate. It's so one of the required clerkships. And you want to, so this is very visible on the dean's radar. They want to look at your clerkship scores. They compare you to medicine, surgery, OBGYN. So this is a very high ticket item for me. Um, and then the deanery, I, we, you're a dean. Uh, and uh, I spent uh, six years as assistant dean of student affairs before I was in this role as an interim chair. And I'll tell you, uh, it was a very um, creative. It was highly administrative, but also very creative. I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, it was a lot of hours, probably, I like to say that old job in student affairs was harder than my new job as a chair in a lot of ways in terms of just the bulk of hours I was doing administratively. But at UCI, we're very fortunate that our associate dean of basic science is one of my faculty in emergency medicine. He's a toxicologist, and he, so he is directing the first two years of the medical school curriculum. He goes to every single class, asks questions, and clarifies things for the students in the audience. He's very engaged. Uh, and they, the, the comments, they love him. It's amazing that he found his place in the world perfectly. <laughs> um, and we also have uh, an emergency physician who's the associate dean for clinical science. And so he directs the, the third and fourth years of the curriculum. Um, and, he, and so he's very involved in you know, getting all the students through their clerkships. And it's, uh, again, a very big administrative load, but very boots on the ground with all the clerkship directors and everything that happens in the third and fourth year. Uh, associate Dean of Admissions is another uh, dean position, again, extremely administrative, bringing students, finding the right, you know, 7,000 applications, trying to find those 104 students can be a little tricky for sure. It takes, takes the whole residency recruitment process to another level, right? Um, and then Assistant Dean uh, Student Affairs, basically, you're working with the students to get them through medical school when something happens in their life or they do something unprofessional, whatever happens along the way, they text you 24 hours a day and you're on their radar picking them up somewhere or meeting them somewhere i mean it gets it's very it's very high touch if, if you if you know what i mean it's very um uh it's it's incredibly impactful uh, role i would say uh and uh i don't miss it because of all of the hours i was spending doing it frankly it was a really hard job um we have a couple of ems people here this is what my base uh, med hospital medical director does lots of committees going around to um, uh, you know, the base 
coordinator meetings, the reviewing the deficiencies with Orange County EMS, a lot of paramedic education, working with tactical emergency medicine, a lot of quality assurance, and then writing about it, researching it, publishing it, getting it all going. And uh, again, a pretty big administrative lift. Very critical to the politics of how patients uh, move around Orange County, though, and to try to maintain our, our, our status as a trauma center, stroke receiving center, cardiovascular receiving center. It's all on his shoulders to make that happen. Um, ED information systems, you know, this is uh, how we basically um, make sure that the EMR supports our financial, educational, and research missions. Uh, he's on a bunch of committees to do that and um, really spends a lot of time with the vendor, who happens to be Epic at all the UCs now, <laughs> and so uh, spends a lot of time optimizing uh, Epic as a point person, and he is constantly being pulled into lots of little uh, disasters in our department when it comes to Epic. We have an ED observation director. Do you guys all have ED observation units? Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> and so um, this is a really exciting job. They uh, have, to, without the ED observation, we have a 20 bed ED observation unit. I don't know how we would ever not be on diversion. We, we, put all, we utilize the heck out of it. it uh, but we can only have 15% failure rate. Uh, and so he's all over each one of us to make sure uh, that we're, we're um, not going over those failure rates. Lots of regulatory stuff going on here with ED observation. Our medical director, I mean, this is a big job. This is, this is like, you know, from soup to nuts, how a patient makes their way through my emergency department. And everything as granular as where the hell are the otoscope tips to uh, as large as meeting with all the other chairs and deans to make sure that um, we're doing the right thing for our patients in the emergency department. And so this is a heavy lift. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's somebody I work as a chair, uh, you know, really in lockstep with uh, on daily hot button issues. And uh, they apprise me of any issues I need to be aware of, um, patient care or professionalism. It's a lot. We have a quality uh, and performance improvement uh, person. This is uh, somebody who works with a lot of basically all the incident reports who come through and somebody misses something or there's a somebody complains about somebody else. It first goes to this person before it gets to me. And, uh, and they call. Uh, hundreds of these <laughs> IRs, it's amazing. And then the big ones make it up to me. Um, they collaborate with task force committees. They work with the national benchmarks like EQUAL and CEDAR uh, and um, find any outliers in our practice and, and roll them in. Uh, ultrasound director, yeah, you know, all the protocols and billing and credentialing that goes into the whole workflow of ultrasound. Uh, so, Thank you for sitting through that first heavy lift. We're over it now. You guys got an idea of the job descriptions and how much time people spend doing stuff uh, in the various uh, areas. So now we're going to get more philosophical. Um, what makes a career in academic medicine unique? That was one of the objectives. And so for me, right off the bat, I noticed that from community to emergency to academic medicine, when you're in academic medicine, you, you start with a lower number of shifts. And I like to say that those shifts for me are like listening to my favorite albums. I, I don't want to listen to them too much and then get burned out on them and not like them anymore. So by having a lower shift load, I think that really offsets burnout, frankly. Uh, it makes every shift amazing. You show up and you finally get to work. It's like, oh, it's been a few days since I've been here. This is, I'm so happy to be here versus, oh my God, I'm here almost every day. And I think that's a big difference between us and the community. Um, and some of you may know some burnout statistics between academic medicine and clinical emergency medicine. I don't know. I couldn't really find any, but I just get the sense, like, I love this album. Led Zeppelin too. When I was in high school, this was like, um, it wasn't out then. It was before I was, I was a little bit later than that. But, uh, but you know, you know uh, the Lemon song, Heartbreaker. I was so nervous that I was starting to get sick of these songs. I was listening to this album like every day, and then it started to dawn on me, I need to, I need to mellow out with this, otherwise I'm gonna burn out on this wonderful, amazing uh, album. And to this day, it's still one of my favorites. So that's how, how I think about my shifts in emergency medicine. Um, I think another key differentiator between us and what the community does, and the community does a lot of teaching and, and stuff, but really it's, it turns out it's really the research. I think that's the, that's the real, thing that is core to every single academic institution and mission is the creation of new material. And it could not be more fun to think about a problem in the emergency department or some clinical thing or some public health thing and then discover or think of ways to fix it and then test it and then 
share it with our colleagues and write about it. It's the, the, the real differentiator, I think, is, is, uh, is this. So whether you're uh, an EMS direct, you know, base hospital director or any role in academic medicine, a medical director, you don't have to be the research director be, to be cranking out publications on the stuff that you're working on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's one of the things. I wasn't a really uh, big operations person became in this role as an interim chair, but now I'm seeing all kinds of opportunities for research all throughout operations as I'm in this role now. So another key differentiator, I think, is that we're not as subjected to the corporatization of emergency medicine for the most part. I know some notable exceptions recently uh, are out there, which I'm not going to get into, but I read this book, Rape of Emergency Medicine, when I was a medical student and it scared the crap out of me about our specialty and I read it again as a junior faculty and I started to calm down about it because in academic uh, medicine uh, at least for the most part we're not as subjected to the whims of the business world and the corporatization of what we do and so that's one of the things I really do I feel like uh, academic emergency medicine jobs for the most part are much more stable the groups are much more stable and I really uh, love that about it um, you know what, it's the best job anywhere in emergency medicine. I mean, where else do you get to have all this collaboration and mentorship? I mean, I've got my fellows down there on the bottom left. We were at a conference together at Mammoth Mountain, so they decided to surprise me, dress up like woolly mammoths. Uh, my fellowship director is uh, in the center slide there, Mike Lambert. We just hung out at AM a couple weeks ago in San Diego. I mean, I have all these wonderful colleagues all over the place and mentees and mentors, and it's like so amazing. I'm at Journal Club with my residents. I'm, you know, on stage in front of 300 people uh, giving, where else do you get to be in medicine where you get to stand up in front of 300 people and give a talk? That's academic medicine, right, for the most part. You know, that's what makes us unique is that people want to hear what we're doing in our academic institutions. Um, and this issue of collaboration is a huge one. I mean, you know, uh, maybe in the private community, it's like you go in and you do your job and you get out of there. And academics, we're collaborating all the time. We're, we're bringing two people together to have a better outcome, have a better idea, combine our talents together. This is from the SAM Guide to an Academic Career. It's, uh, it's, you, could, you could Google it. I came right up when I Googled it, actually. And I found this great quote in here about collaboration. It's difficult and one will fail if they operate in an academic vacuum, the extent to which an individual can network and collaborate and can dictate their success. Multidisciplinary collaboration within the same or outside one's institution is the hallmark of the modern scientist, educator, and others who contribute to the creation and dispersal of new knowledge. These are beautiful sentences they put together in this. Can I just tell you? Uh, for those in traditional academics, collaboration will make it easier to get research grant support. External collaborators from national and international medical centers can get letters. And when you go up for promotion, it's all about the collaboration. We just had a discussion a few minutes ago. I mean, just reached out to me and wanted to help me and collaborate. It's amazing. But I mean, don't take it from me. Take it from Vanilla Ice, right? When he said, stop, collaborate, and listen. And that may be the take home message for this whole talk. I'm not sure. Um, and then we stay on the cutting edge. Uh, and what I mean by this is when I was an intern, uh, I got hazed incredibly hard by a third year resident. Uh, and I looked up to him clinically so much, but I would like come to work. My first day on the job, I wore a tie. Mark Landorf told us we had to wear ties when we came to work, so all the interns show up in a tie. He walked over to me, grabbed me by the tie, took scissors out of his pockets, and cut my tie right off my neck. And I'm standing there with like a quarter of a tie hanging down, and I felt so stupid. And like, uh, you know, hey, quit, quit kissing up to the boss and get to work. You know, that's what he said to me. I'm like, whoa, this, is, this got real really quick. And, you know, at conference, he would always, you know, pick on me for medical knowledge issues and stuff. And it was so hard that first year. And I always look up to him. Now, I still know he took care of my dad the other night. He works in the community emergency medicine, the same doctor down at Mission Hospital. And he took care of my dad the other night at 4 in the morning. I came in there with him and saw him. And he kept going on and on about how he feels like he doesn't have his, he's not keeping up with uh, clinical emergency medicine. Like, these community docs really look up to us in academics as being right on the leading edge of all the research and, and uh, all the foam ed that's coming out. They're, you know, they really do look up to us that way. So that's nice. We get to be on that, on that edge. Um, we're also really technologically competent in academic medicine, right? I mean, you think about the foam ed movement. Uh, it's uh, an ultrasound we call foam us. And uh, it's really just blowing up and it's, there's a lot of curation that needs to go on here to make sure it's legit. And that, all that curation and crowdsourcing is really um, being led by, the, by academic medicine, thankfully. 
Um, I mean, you could see here, if, I think, again, Vanilla Ice would be proud. They stopped, they're collaborating, and they're listening, all right there on that old uh, device there. Um, and getting your brand out there in a free and open access way, that, that basically defines democratizing your brand. And it's been shown for years in business that that's a good thing, get it out there for free, let everybody get access to it. And that's what we're doing in academic medicine, I think, with all of this foam movement. And uh, ultimately, it's going to have to come back and be part of our promotions package. And that's a whole separate talk on its own, getting social media into your promotions package. Um, now, what are the, some of the challenges? So those are the cool things about academics. And you can tell I'm really excited about all that stuff. And hopefully, I'm not going to get sick of my favorite songs anytime soon. But the challenges, though, is that you really do burn the candle at both ends. I mean, again, uh, we were just talking about this. I mean, it's crazy. My wife will say to me, your effing laptop never closes. And she's right. I mean, it's so tempting when as soon as I start to see people in my household start falling asleep or they get into a movie, I might just peek it open and start, you know, working on my next talk. It's, it's, and, it's, uh, and this happens with the deanery positions, too, because they like emergency medicine deans at the medical school. Why? Because we work evenings or nights, and so we're around during the day. And, it's, and at first, especially as junior faculty, you're like, oh, this is great. I could do both these jobs at the same time. Duh, it makes all the sense in the world. But then we end up working a tremendous amount of extra hours, and it could take its toll on you. So you have to, that's what I mean by that student affairs job. I mean, it, it, took, it took me out of commission for like five years. Um, you know, when you're junior, you really feel the need to move quickly, you know, and uh, to turn up your patients per hour and your uh, work RVUs. Those, these things all get tracked no matter where you work, clinical, I mean, uh, community or academics. And so, but boy, when you're junior, you're also not as confident uh, about, uh, kept, you know, missing something. You're, you're, you feel like you're, uh, you know, a little bit more vulnerable uh, for lawsuits and stuff. I think earlier on in your career, that starts to fade a little bit. Uh, I think as you get through this and you start to see a larger denominator of people, you know, and what happens with some of these suits and that they don't always go somewhere. But I feel like um, there is this pressure early on in your career to go fast, but then you're like nervous you're going to miss something. So that is a challenge for sure junior faculty face. Um, your clinical shift load is definitely higher when you're junior. So even though you come in with, even from day one, with probably less shifts than you'd work in the community, uh, you look at some of the more senior faculty, they figured out ways to buy down their shifts and trade grants and to, you know, protected time and stuff. So over time, you figure that out too. You know, you feel compelled to say yes. There's someone throwing you an opportunity. It sounds like a really cool opportunity. I know Jen and I talk about this all the time. And it's so hard to say no to stuff that sounds so cool to you. And it's probably okay to say yes to most of them. But if it's not sounding really cool to you, then I don't know. Uh, you got to learn how to say no to some things. I'll teach you a technique for that in a second. Um, and likely there's a generational gap between you, a millennial, and the folks that govern you, uh, Generation X or even the baby boomers. So th th sometimes it's hard to relate with each other and we're, you know, always, that's kind of a, that's by definition one of the struggles that a junior faculty faces. And you feel like this niche clock is ticking. It's like, come on, I got to find my space. I got to figure out what I'm doing. Uh, that's a little bit distressing to junior faculty. They're in my office saying, I got to figure out which way my career is going to go, and I got to get my niche, my niche, my niche. Um, and once you find your niche, then you, where are you going to find the time to develop it and the resources to get that faculty development into your niche? And you know what? You got to figure out, it's, especially with the millennials, there's this expectation that you're going to successfully leverage all the social media, and it's getting more and more overwhelming. It's like a giant sea. Where do I start? Is Twitter even going to be a thing 10 years from now, or is it going to be the thing 10 years from now? It's a lot of pressure there to figure out where to go with social media and have it be part of your promotions package, because we know how, know how impactful it can be. And frankly, you're not famous yet. I know that sounds a little bit obnoxious, but what I mean by that is, you, uh, you're you're all, you're trying to try out for all these, you know, the speaker um, uh, tryouts. You know, you're on stage and, and you're trying to get you're trying to get your name out there, and and you're not getting as many invitations to go to these talks that you're really excited to someday do that. But it takes a while and to to practice your speaking style and get up there, and suddenly all that starts to happen, and it's super fun. And so that's really for me been one of the major fun parts of my career is being able to to do this, to be on the mic and talking to people and sharing stories. So uh, what can you do? I think the, 
One of the things uh, that I learned in one of these development courses I took was this book right here, Strengths uh, Finder 2.0 by Tom Rath. I'm not going to throw a bunch of books up here for you to read, but that is one that I would start with. Uh, it's just short. It's maybe 100 pages, and there's a test that you take at the end. You answer questions for about an hour, and then it tells you what your, you know, your strengths are. And the concept with this book is don't try to cover up weaknesses. Don't go after your weaknesses. My weaknesses are spreadsheets and everything, cost accounting and differential cost accounting. That's what I suck at. And I need to know it better for sure. But really find out what your strengths are and like go after your strengths and, and leverage those. Because if you have a natural talent and then you spend time developing that talent, that's really how you become an expert in that area. And then you can really propel. Um, Find a mentor. This is uh, something incredibly helpful. Mentors have great ideas, stuff that's on their plate that they just can never get to. They pass on to you. And this is sometimes how a niche happens. And so identify somebody, a few people, and that's uh, a natural fit. The mentor-mentee relationship has to be somewhat organic. And sometimes it feels a little bit stilted. Maybe it's not the right one. But you've got to find that, that, uh, that mentor. And they can help motivate you. They give you advice. Uh, they can give you the right direction. I constantly reach out to my mentors for all kinds of things all the time. Uh, and the support and the nurturing that they give me is uh, invaluable. Um, and then you got to develop this niche we talked about. And the best niche is sort of, you know, you've got the stuff you love, the stuff people want, and the stuff you're good at, right? And, you know, the stuff you love and the stuff you're good at, if you could combine those two things, you're kind of getting there. The stuff you love and the stuff people want, that's better. Um, the stuff you're good at, stuff people want, yeah, not bad, but you, the sweet spot is somewhere in between. It's kind of like dating. You've got lovers, soulmates, and friends, and you know you want to get out of that friend zone down there, right? You want to stay out of there. I got stuck in the friend zone for four years with the woman I ultimately married. Luckily, uh, I got out of it. It was really tricky, though. Um, but uh, but you know you got star-crossed lovers, friends with benefits, somewhere in the middle of all of that. It's sort of like a niche. It's like finding that sweet spot. So. Good luck on both those categories. I know junior faculty face the other thing as well. Um, and then this whole thing about saying yes, uh, and then you know you figure it out afterwards. You make it to you fake it. Frankly, when they wanted me to become the interim chair, that's exactly how I felt. I'm like, I this is going to be really scary. But uh, I just kind of started copying off the car in front of me. You know, the other chairs, emergency medicine, and uh, and I started to finally you know get the get the car going. So at any stage along your career, you're going to feel a little out of your comfort zone. But then you sort of commit to something and you can start to, you know, it sucks at first, then you get better and better, better at it until you become an expert in it. And so I think it's okay to say less, yes to a lot of stuff. But if you really don't want to do something, this is what I tell people. I say, listen, this sounds like a cool opportunity. I can't thank you enough for thinking of me. Uh, however, I have so much on my plate. My bandwidth is zero right now, and I will only frustrate you with delays and confusion. So let's avoid that. And, you know, I'm, Thank you very much. I do have somebody in mind, though, that would be really good for this. So I have the next person, your mentee, or somebody you think would be good at it, to pass that along to. Um, there's so much great faculty development out there. Uh, I mean, you look at the AAMC. If you're interested in doing more dean stuff, the AAMC is definitely the place to be. They've got a tremendous, all kinds of wonderful uh, development going on over there. They have the Medical Education Research Certificate. If you're interested in you know, getting your research skills, it's sort of like a uh, baby version of embers, if you will. Uh, they have at the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health, they have all kinds of leadership courses from medical directors uh, to chairs. I did one of the chair ones. Um, the faculty development uh, for the ASEP Teaching Fellowship. I mean, the, have, have any of you done the teaching, ASEP Teaching Fellowship? I think, Sarah, you did it, right? Yeah. Um, this is uh, incredible. Um, uh, just, Sarah, did that happen? All those things on that slide? Was that... Is, that, is this true to form? OK, good. Uh, I mean, it's a really great place. And how long was that, fe that teaching fellowship? Two years are dedicated. So you go in the fall, spring, Yeah, so two weeks of dedicated development here. And I notice my faculty, when they come back, they're different. Like, they're, they are sort of processing it at first. And then like two weeks later, they have all kinds of, they're in my office with all kinds of crazy ideas. So it's great. Um, and then we have our own conference at UCI, shameless plug. We have the elite uh, engaging learners through innovation and technology. And actually, one of our med ed tech fellows, Sarah Paradise, is right here. Sarah, we all got to introduce ourselves in the beginning. You came in a little bit. But uh, so she's our, our, our med ed tech fellow. It's a two-year fellowship we have at UCI. And she helped design this elite course. And it's a lot of slide design, um, 
uh, writing smart learning objectives, team-based learning. It's all sort of podcasting, vodcasts, all the modern ways that we teach people. And we had it at the Great Wolf Lodge, this water park. Uh, so we have this conference every year. Embers, I did this. Who else did Embers? Anybody else in here do Embers? I, I found this incredibly helpful. I did it like right after I became an attending 20 years ago or something. And this was uh, just launched me, gave me lots of great ideas to get started with all the research I wanted to do. So this was the, the, the beginning of, of my whole research portfolio. It was right here at Embers, and I really did get a lot out of it. Uh, the lead fellowship at AAMC, I did this one too. This was really good. It was a two-year fellowship and uh, a lot of dean, dean stuff, and that's where I made a lot of networking, lots of people uh, who became my mentors uh, later through this lead fellowship. There's this chair development program. Uh, I did this, it was a year long, 50 hours of in-class time. At the end of this program, I wrote a list of 10 reasons why I'd never want to be chair. <laughs> and then here I am, so, you know. <laughs> and it was really all the math that scares me uh, with the budgets and stuff. But other than that, the job's actually really cool. But so if you ever did want to be a chair, if you're a vice chair and you're thinking about this downstream, this is invaluable. You really do, there's lots of networking and they hook you up with a mentor and everything who is already a chair. It's great, I found this very useful. Uh, and then you plug these things into your CV. You, these are all become CV hits for you. And with little descriptions, um, I have a little leadership sort of area in my CV where I just put the descriptions on there. And that helps as you're moving through. You, you, you know, someone who doesn't know you, they're like looking through your CV, they see all this leadership activity or other faculty development. It should all be on there. Uh, and then conferencing. I think it's really important to go to conferences and network and meet other people and uh, maybe that slide's not necessarily what I'm trying to get out here now that I look at it, but I feel like um, this is really where a lot of great ideas can, can happen from, you know, uh, where uh, you, you just combine and synergize and straight from the SAM guide to an academic career, work on interpersonal skills, communication styles, confrontation skills, all these kinds of things are really important for your uh, career development. Without that, you know, without these communication skills. So if that's, a, if that's not one of your strengths, uh, it, it's certainly conferencing and networking and getting up on stage and being in team-based learning sessions and small groups. I think all that really helps. And then I like to say get some minions. And I mean this in the most loving way possible. Um, I, and I, I really do. If you look at my CV and all the publications, every single one has a medical student on it. 100% of my publications have a medical student on it. And I feel like if you get a little group of these uh, folks, uh, your mentees, and they're really, they, they, they're trying to advance their careers, uh, they tend to have a little more time than you do, and then they start like synergizing with each other, and this whole thing starts to become its own engine, uh, that's, that's invaluable. And so this can be undergraduate researchers, medical students, the, the higher they, up, they get through the ranks, they get more capable, but they also get more busy. Like residence has been very challenging for me to, to, uh, to work with uh, for a lot of these uh, educational and research projects. But uh, medical students for me is sort of like the, the sweet spot because they have time and they have knowledge and uh, they're very motivated to get to the next stage. And so that's been for me all the medical students. So that's been a really positive thing. Here's, here they are here. This was a conference about six months ago uh, in, um, at the World Congress of Ultrasound Medical Education. And uh, there, this is medical students, sonographers, fellows, you know, the minions, if you will. Uh, and they're going to end up on all the publications that came from all the abstracts that were presented at this conference. Um, so funding is very, very important. And I don't want to, you know, dive too down this rabbit hole. But SAM's got some great links there and categorizes all the funding opportunities on there. I would start there. I think other people are going to touch on that. And um, I think it's really important to find a good boss. When you're choosing a job, if it's not the right fit, if, if it's not the right boss for you, I mean, look at this. 99% of employees would use boss as a human shield in the event of a workplace attack. <laughs> it's from The Onion, so it's not true, but it's still funny. Uh, but, you know, you got to find the right boss. I think because um, the chairs really are critical for your career planning, uh, they know the rules, they know how to navigate the institution, and you want to really have an idea of what their expectations are of you as, as, your, as your boss. Now, this is the Junior Faculty Development Forum. Probably this, this term millennials applies to a lot of people, like it or not, this is the term. Uh, this, is, this is the thing. So about half the workforce are millennials. I'm uh, Generation X. Uh, and we're a tiny little blip on the radar screen of human beings right now. The millennials are way huge, and this is what your colleagues are going to get through this 
you are going to go through this promotion process a lot faster than us, the Xers, did because um, there's just a lot more of you and a lot less of us. So, uh, so there's some unique things about, about millennials. Uh, not only do you guys, the, the males, tend to have really cool facial hair, uh, but you're also very socially aware, you're multitaskers, you're dream chasers, you're entrepreneurs, you love to collaborate, you're very, tend to be pragmatic, um, leveraging social media, open-minded. Um, those are all the positive things, uh, and that's why I love working millennials so much. And uh, the one thing, though, you gotta be careful of avocado toast, okay? This is how you're gonna go broke, all right? Millennials love avocado toast, and so does my 10-year-old. Uh, but this is, <laughs> so there's a little uh, advice for you. And this is what, in my mind, this is how I, I think of millennials. They're like, uh, they're being so creative, they're collaborating, they're all, you know, listening to each other. Uh, again, it's Vanilla Ice 101 here with the, with the millennials and all this wonderful creativity going on. And I love going to resident conference and seeing the TBL sessions and everybody's sort of working together and the research going on, it's amazing. But millennials want a coach and not a boss, okay? They want a cheerleader and not you know, the heavy, so to speak. So they want to be um, coached down their career and then sort of get out of the way when we need to. It's more like, let's go do this rather than you go do that. And that's the generational divide between sort of my generation and a millennial generation is that we tend to be more command and control and millennials are a lot more consensus driven, collabor collaboration and let's all go together as a team. So it's, it's, it's an important message for your generation as much as it is for my generation so we can, we can help each other along. And it's really more about, you know, you know you found the right boss if they're doing a lot of asking and a little bit less telling. And I think that's sort of in line with uh, uh, a lot more of your generation. So to summarize this talk, I want you to find your strengths. I want you to find a mentor, develop a niche, say yes, but consider no, get some development, conference, network, develop your communication skills, get some minions, engage your chair, mellow out on the avocado toast, and ultimately stop, collaborate, and listen. Thank you very much.